Good morning, everyone. Welcome this morning. Please stand, and we're going to introduce a new song this morning. It is catchy and it's upbeat, and I think you'll catch on really quick because it's super simple.
Hey, good morning, church family. Uh, that was like the first day of school. <laughs> good morning, church family. Good morning. Oh, that was a little bit better. Uh, I see a few unfamiliar faces around, so welcome to Everett Assembly of God. I'm sure somebody will be around to greet you uh, and make you feel at home. Um, I have a thank you card to read uh, this morning to my amazing church family. Words can never say how I feel, how I love, and need you all. The outpouring of texts, calls, cards, and concern over Mick and I has been a blessing beyond words. Thank you for the player, prayers, thoughts, and help. Love, Tina. So, all right. Uh, today, don't forget, is uh, one of, another one of our meals to help support our trip to NISM. Um, I think in November. Um, so if you want to help support the trip to Nysum, please get a meal. Today is sweet Italian sausage and halluski, um, and it is by donation. So feel free to give any amount. Uh, tonight, come out for prayer, praise, and seek time, 6 o'clock. Just a reminder that the church is open from 7 to 8.30 on Sunday mornings um, to do the same. Wednesday night, we will have children's ministries. Uh, at seven o'clock and pastor began a new series this week called for the respectable sins correct um there is a clothing giveaway and yard sale breeze with lighthouse that is from this wednesday through friday also on friday is the family night at the curb if you signed up for and got your tickets for already um, you will be coming and the eating there as well at five um, for a burger bar i think it's an all you can eat burger bar and the game begins at six o'clock. Home groups. Um, I, I heard a testimony yesterday about home groups and how many people are actually coming to that. And that's a fantastic thing to happen. And uh, you know, hopefully that grows and continues to grow. 
but that is Saturday at 5 p.m. at Nick and Tina's, unless that changed. Is that, yeah, okay, good. Uh, there is a water baptism Sunday, August 19th, one week from today, or 18th, sorry, one week from today at 4 o'clock at Richard and Kim's. If you do not know where Richard and Kim live, Richard or Kim isn't in there. So you'll have to find Richard and Kim. I think they're over in the kitchen. They'll be serving meals today. Um, it's out Black Valley, about three, three and a half miles. Um, NISOM, Sunday, August 25th at noon, a meeting for all who are going on the trip. Uh, remember that we are collecting school supplies for Operation Christmas Child. Um, and you can also give uh, cash donations as well. Coming up here in September, the power team or power force or whatever they're called now uh, will be here um, at both services. So encourage people to come out and, and see that ministry in action. If the ushers would come. And then for any and all other updates, check out the website, Facebook, and any other, any other modes that we have. If you'll bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we just come to you today, Lord, and we just thank you for beautiful weather, Lord. We thank you that we have breath and can breathe today, Lord. Lord, we just pray over this service, Lord, and over this offering, Lord, that you would use it to further your kingdom. Lord, we just ask that you would just bless every everyone that is here today, Lord, that, that the Holy Spirit would move in this place today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 If you're able, please stand and we'll join our voices and our hearts together.
God. Will you say the name of Jesus with me? Say it out loud. Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. He is the name above every name. Hallelujah. Praise God. We declare the name of Jesus right now in every need that is represented in this building today. We're representing the power of God in our lives. When we say the name of Jesus, we say healing for our bodies. When we say the name of Jesus, sickness and disease are gone in your name. When we say the name of Jesus, we know, we know that people will not only be saved, but they'll be healed and restored. And Lord, that we're believing in the name of Jesus, people are saved even as we say that name. Hallelujah. We're believing for our families. We're believing for every stronghold, every addiction that is in the lives of people. Lord, that there would be release in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. When I was praying this week, one time in my prayer time, I was just shouting out the name of Jesus over and over again. And I want you to shout it out again. The name of Jesus. Will you say it with me? Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. There's no better name. There's no greater name than Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise God. Praise God. We declare, we declare the healing virtue of Jesus Christ to flow through this place today. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. We shout the name of Jesus from the bottom of our hearts because we believe, Lord. We believe you're the answer to every need. Yes, every concern. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. It is your name that's above every name, where every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. You are Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. We shout your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. If God is good, I want to hear you say amen. 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 Then you believe that God is good. That's great. Amen. That's what we want to hear today. God is faithful. Will you say amen? Amen. He's faithful. If God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, will you say amen? Amen. Amen. He is. He is faithful. Thankful, Lord, I serve God. I don't know what happened to me this week in prayer when I was praying. I just told you that I was just saying the name of Jesus over and over. I don't know why. I just felt overwhelmed by the presence of God. And I want to tell you that there is just, there's something in praise. There is, there's power in praise. Amen. There is power. God is, God hears your prayers and he knows your heart's desire. But honor him, bless him, praise him. Uh, he deserves it. Amen, because he can never, ever make a mistake. Isn't that what we talked about just recently? God never, ever makes a mistake. Praise the Lord. I just want to remind everyone today that uh, water baptism is next week, as long as the weather is permitting. Um, and you know what? We're baptizing children. Isn't that great? And uh, I know that uh, that is exciting to me. And kids that have given their life to the Lord. We've had some really special kids in our church. And great teachers that are teaching them and instructing them in God. And so today we have a meeting in the library. A very brief meeting for those of you that are being baptized. Okay? All right. Praise God. We're going to let the kids go. Have a great time, guys. The rest of you, um, you can open your Bibles to Psalms 89. And Psalms 139, if you like, um, we're going to, we have it on the, the um, PowerPoint today. I'll, I'll be sharing it with you. We'll say it out loud together. But um, 
just a reminder that um, you should always bring your Bible to church anyway. Right? Yes. I have I don't know how many Bibles in my office, and I go to a service and I don't take a single Bible. Isn't that terrible? I've showed up to events without my Bible. So I hope you have it on your phone if you don't have it any other way. Praise God. I want to talk to you today about passion for the presence of God. I hope and pray that in every assembly of God, you can feel the presence of God. Amen. I hope you can sense the passion for God. It's not in every church that you sense the presence of God and the passion for God. And uh, I, I just pray that this, this is my heart's desire and cry, that we see more and more of a passion for God in our church. I'm going to ask you if you would just stand one more time, and I want you to look at the screen, and we're going to uh, read a couple of verses of Scripture out of Psalms. Psalms 189, verse 15. Let's say it together. Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O oh Lord, in the sight of your countenance. And the next one, please. Psalms 139, verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? Our kind, loving Father, we're so blessed today to serve you, to honor you through your word. Lord, we've honored you through worship today. May we truly continue that worship as we look at your word today. I pray that your presence would continue to flourish in our hearts and our lives and our minds, and it would go from this place of worship to wherever you take us, Lord, this week. May you be glorified through this word today. I pray that you would continue to anoint us, anoint the ears to hear, anoint my, my voice, anoint my heart, Lord, as I share today. May Christ be honored and praised. Amen. And we pray this in your name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Praise God. When we think of the word passion, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Well, when we have a passion for something, we do not find it difficult to spend time with the person that we have passion for. Or an event. We have no problem going to an event where we have a passion and desire for that event. We don't have to stop and ask ourselves if it's really what you want to participate in or not, because you're already passionate about it. You want to be there, just like you're in God's house today. You want to be here and usually make sure that all of us participate in something that we are very clear and close to. Well, Proverbs 27, 7 says, A satisfied soul loathes the honeycomb. Now, if you reflect on that verse, you have to think about the cares and the desires and the pleasures that are most vulnerable to us. Some of them can even dull our hunger and for God's sweet fellowship and desire in our heart. It is very easy to get sidetracked on those things that we're passionate for that are not necessarily a godly thing. But God wants us to have passion in our life. But the Bible is full of both good and bad passion. There are many examples of failures as a result of the wrong kind of passion. The scripture is full of it. Everywhere you go, the Old and the New Testament, there are examples of extraordinary faith for God also as a godly passion. We find it all the way through God's word. And there appears to be two major groups within the church that are differing about the presence of God. This is what I've noticed as I've been pastoring for a number of years, noticing over the years these two things. Some seek God for what he can do for them. Others seek God for who he is. 
Some see God for what he can do for them. Others say, I want to see God for what he can give me. So there is a confusion with what motivates God's presence. How do we find the presence? How do we seek for the presence of God? I want us to see our motivation for that presence of God and how we can seek for his presence and who he really is. So I have three questions I want you to help you answer today. Number one, what is the core motivation for God's presence? What is the motivation for God's prayer? What's the core message in understanding the presence of God? There is a contrast that I want to give you between Moses and the Israelites. So let's go quickly through the story of Moses and the Israelites, this contract. First, let's look at the Israelites' core motivation. Israel passionately desired to be set free from the bondage of Egypt. You know the story. They acknowledged God as their deliverer. This is what they really wanted. Just like those in the church who want to be delivered from the systems of this world, but without them knowing it, they're still held captive to it. The Israelites were still held captive to be in Egypt's bondage land. For hundreds of years, the Israelites were crying out for God to deliver them. So God appeared to Moses and begins to carry out God's plan at the joy of the Israelites. They realized that God is in it, and they bowed and they worshiped God. They could not wait to be delivered from slavery. Now, can you imagine their emotions? They're watched for years, in fact, for generations coming and going for the deliverance, and suddenly God comes through with a man named Moses who's going to save them. And they do nothing but praise God, and they support Moses. They love it. They're excited. Then Moses meets with Pharaoh, but the leaders of Egypt are not impressed with Moses' design for delivery, and it's held off for some time. However, in time, God is merciful, and he delivers his people with signs and wonders. There is all of the, all of the happenings in Egypt where God brings the plagues upon them. Eventually, what happens is Pharaoh releases those people, and they're not only free, but man, they also have gold. And they also have silver, and it's lavished in them. I'm telling you, their confidence in Moses was at an all-time high. Praise God, we're getting delivered, and Moses is going to lead us out. And then once they are out of Egypt, God leads them to the Red Sea. They look back and they see Pharaoh is pursuing them. That's when they begin a huge attitude change. They bitterly lash out at Moses, and they begin to complain, even though it was God that led them what I call the wit's end corner. There's nowhere to go. The Pharaoh's army's behind them. There's mountains on either side of them. The Red Sea's in front of them. They are hemmed in. There's nothing they can do. They are at absolute wit's end corner, and they're blaming Moses. Listen to what they say in Exodus chapter 14. He said, they said to Moses, was it because there was no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. That's not what they were really saying. You understand, you see how everything gets reversed and changed. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die here in the desert. Can you imagine this? Here they are. Then in chapter 16, in verse 8, Moses tells them their complaints are not against him, but it's against the Lord. And notice they said, it would have been better for us. Get that phrase. It would have been better for us. 
Here's what's happening. They lack the burning desire of God's heart. They were consumed with their own love for their own lives. They were consumed for their safety. They had forgotten what God had said. They forgot what God brought Moses to lead them out. But once again, God's merciful and he splits the sea. They cross on dry ground and then they're, they're on God sweeps out the and destroys completely Pharaoh's army. He swallows them up. They're destroyed. They rejoice on the other side, and they are having the greatest worship service you could ever imagine with a million people. Can you imagine what's happening? Wow. Now in a few days pass, and food becomes an issue. They begin to whine, and they say in Exodus chapter 16, Oh, we sat by the pot of uh, the pots of meat, and when we ate bread on the full, for you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now, man, here's Mo. How would you like to be Moses? How would you like to be a guy like Moses, who is constantly, God's using him, and he just keeps getting ripped by these people over and over and they're buying into a lie that the enemy of satan and they're they're relying on their feelings they're relying on their emotions they're looking at their circumstances now you see this is a pattern it happens over and over with the israelites they're happy as long as god's doing what they want they're more they're core motive is evidenced by their own behavior it's all about them they elevate their desires over a heart for the presence of god it's more important that we're safe and we're comfortable and that we see what we want to see than it is to have a heart for god to believe and trust him when you can't see the evidence so i want you to notice here god's presence is there as long as he's doing the things that are good and giving them what they want. The fact is, God's presence is not dependent on my circumstances. Amen. This is what we're seeing in our own world. People are looking at the present condition. They're looking at our nation and they're saying, what in the world are we going to do? What happens if certain, something this happens and that happens? What are we going to do? Everything's coming in on us and our nation is being literally destroyed. Our freedoms are being taken away from us and people are beginning to really persecute Christians and we're seeing it in our own nation. People are looking at the present condition and as if God's not involved. But I'm here to tell you this morning, God God is in supreme control of everything that's happening right now in our nation. He always was, he is now, and he will continue. He is involved. So this cycle repeats itself over and over again until, until Moses, until God is so fed up. Here's what he tells Moses in Exodus chapter 33. Leave this place, you and the people who brought up out of Egypt, and go to the land that I promised and owed to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send it to an angel before you and drive you out of the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Persians, Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. Wow. God is concerned. God is angry. God is upset with their, their so-called, you want me? You're searching after you and your feelings. That's their core motivation. But what was Moses' core motivation? See, they were just the opposite. God promises to lead his people into the promised land, and send a choice angel with them to drive out their enemies. Now, his presence would be with them. Now, it's a good thing that God did not make this offer to the Israelites, but he made it to Moses. They might have accepted the offer and been willing to return back to Egypt without the angel and go back to their comfort. But that wasn't the case. Moses replies in Exodus 33, Verse 15, for your presence does not go with us. Do not bring us up from 
here. In other words, what's he saying? Don't bring us up from here. Where is here? Here is the desert. He's talking about the desert. It's a place of hardship. A land of void of comfort and of pleasure. There is no, no abundance. There's no gardens. There's no natural resources. There's no security. There's no homes or fields or fruit trees to eat from. They had to depend on the supernatural power of God himself. Amen. Think about this. And Moses was willing to do that. There is no beauty in the land. It's mundane. No great surroundings. It's hot. Moses is saying, I would rather have your presence, God, in this uncomfortable place, in a land of abundance and beauty. I would rather be here than a great place of beauty. Isn't that amazing? It was better to be in a difficult circumstance and be in God's presence than to have it all without God. Wow. So his heart's crying. He's crying for God's presence rather than his promised blessing. I want your presence, God. And he's desiring intimacy with God more than all the treasures of life. And this is what set Moses from the Israelites. They sought God for what he did while Moses sought God for who he was, for who he is. This is one of the reasons Moses was selected by God to be the leader in the first place, because he's seeking him with passion for the right reason. A passion for God is about a relationship that's not based upon what one person can do for me, and it's about loving someone who is, says who he is. It's like the difference between a woman marrying a man for his money or marrying him for who he is. Yes, intimacy cannot flourish with the wrong motivation. Earthly rewards, such as having all the things you want, the famous people. I think of the famous athletes and the movie stars and all these people, wealthy, wealthy people. I mean, it can't even be compared to the presence of God. When you hear an athlete say, oh, this is what I've owned all my life, the Super Bowl, or winning the championship, or winning in the Olympics that we're going through right now. Oh, this is the greatest feeling in all the world. There is no feeling more like having the feeling of being in the presence of God. Amen. 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 The presence of God. So the comparison's impossible. The scripture describes Moses in Hebrews 11. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. He looked to the reward, not the things that are happening on this earth, but to the ultimate reward. So his reward was not in the promised land. It was in the promise of God's presence to be with him. And after you encounter God in a burning bush, I mean, Moses, you know the story. Moses encounters God in a burning bush, and bush is speaking to him, and God's presence is there. Moses never changed after that. He wanted to be intimately in the presence of God. Amen. So the presence of God is everywhere, even if you don't feel it. You might not feel the presence of God right now. And you can't measure the presence of God through numbers or outward success. It's measured through a personal intimate relationship. So when that relationship is being nurtured, the important successes will be manifested. As you nurture the presence of God, you'll have the manifestations, which we're going to talk about in a few moments. You will be present in your life. John Wesley said, if I had 300 men who feared nothing but God, hated nothing but sin, and were determined to know nothing among men but Jesus Christ and him crucified, I would set the world on fire. 
I would set the world on fire. If people had a passion for God, not what God can do for them, but who God is. Amen. You agree? Yes, amen. Praise God. Here's the second question. How is the presence of God found in Scripture? Well, I want to share with you two of them today. In Psalms 139, verse 7, when, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? So here's the, the omnipresence of God. We all, most of us know here, if you're a Christian for any period of time, you understand the omnipresence of God. It describes God's presence everywhere, right? And so David says in verse 8, and verse 11 and 12, if I go to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the place of the dead, you are there. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are both alike to you. Wow. Again, though we can't sense his presence, it doesn't negate his presence. I want to say it again. Though we can't sense his presence, it doesn't negate his presence. Amen. God is always here. You don't have to feel it. You don't necessarily always feel it. Again, we need to understand how important that is. I had a friend, a really close friend. In fact, his wife was the babysitter of our oldest son, Philip when we were in Bible college, our, our freshman year in Bible college, his wife was tragically uh, killed in an automobile accident. My son would have been in that car normally, but that day he wasn't. She had a uh, head on, she ran into the back of a, I think it was the back of a truck, right? And I'll never forget this funeral. I'll never, I can still see him. He's in that funeral service and he's standing up front and he's turned around and we're were singing worship songs at her funeral. And he's standing there with both hands raised to the sky, worshiping and honoring the Lord, even at the death of his wife. Yeah. And he loved his wife. They had a great marriage. They were a great young couple. But I that left an impact on me knowing that the presence of God was more important to him than even the circumstances he was facing. And he was a young man. They were like in their 20s or early 30s. They were very young. And I mean, precious couple. But I, I never forget that. So the presence of God, sometimes you don't feel. And you can feel it in the worst of circumstances because God's faithful to visit with his spirit in our hearts. Amen. Amen. Here's the second part of that is the manifest presence of God. Where the word manifest means to bring forth the unseen the unheard, the unknown. It manifests itself in some form. This is what Moses wanted so badly. This is where we, we desire passionately to see God in our spirits, in our minds, in our thoughts, where it actually is seen outwardly. And become, we become close to it. Now, in John's Gospel, John chapter 14, verse 21, Jesus said, I will love him and manifest myself to him. This is when we acknowledge that uh, is revealed in our mind. He will tell us. He will, in our mind, God lets us know that he, who he is. Psalms 89, 15. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, O Lord. Peter says in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So God can manifest his presence in different ways. In the Bible, some saw him, others heard his voice, others sensed his nearness. We can't see Jesus physically. We can sense his nearness. We know his nearness by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives with us. When the presence of God is manifested, we don't have to wonder if it's him or not. The manifestation is there and known in our innermost being, we know he's present. Amen. I could really feel it in our worship service this morning. Yes. As we were singing the songs, I could feel and sense the manifest presence of God. 
And I know that our songs are prayed over. I know that our worship team prays over this stuff. This is important to them, just as it's important to preaching a sermon and a message, be either we hear and know the presence and the power of God. Most Christians want to experience a manifest presence, but they want to, and easily, just, they dismiss it, and they want to begin to seek after the manifestation, which we'll get to in a moment. I want to use uh, Elijah as an example. If you go to 1 Kings chapter 19, I think it might be on the overhead there, there is a great mighty wind. God talks about a great mighty wind, but the Lord wasn't in the wind with the prophet Elijah. There was a great earthquake, but the Bible says God was not in that earthquake. There was a fire, but God was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the still small voice of God. And that's where Elijah had a personal encounter with the presence of God. The still small voice, the inner voice of God. Too many times, People will try to seek God's presence based on an experience that they might have had with God prior. For example, if they experience a shaking, the power of God comes and they feel a shaking. That's an outward manifestation that occurs and they're seeking to feel God and they want God in the same manner. So they seek for that shaking instead of seeking God. Let me put it this way. We're a Pentecostal church. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in an unknown tongue. We believe that we need to seek that. We need to seek that gift that is a special gift and due from God from on high. We are believing, believing that God, and I'm going to be preaching on this sometime soon, I hope, and I'm believing God that he wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit. I know I talked to you just this week. John has been seeking for the Holy Spirit to come. And one of the first things I think I told you, John, is don't seek the tongue. Seek him. Seek God. Don't seek for the manifestation of what happens when you receive an unknown tongue. You seek God. As you seek God, as you seek God, he will give you the gift and you will speak the manifestation of that gift. And that's what's extremely important for us to understand. We're not instructed to be, to be still for nothing. We're not instructed, you know, in, in the word of God to seek a man. Say, God never said, seek tongues. He said, seek him. Seek him. And those things will come. Sometimes when we're, there is a manifestation that has really touched people, they will try to mimic that. And what happened in another time or in another service and not necessarily the way that God wants to manifest his presence. God does not manifest himself the same way in every single service. Amen. And so some people have felt like God wasn't present because there's not some particular manifestation in that service. Listen, God is present here today. He was here last week. He was here last month, last year, 20 years ago, 30, 40, 50 years ago, 60 years ago. God's presence is still here. Amen. And he will continue. A service can seem flat. Like we learned a new song this morning. Some people say, well, I can't worship God when I, when I have a new song. Thank God for the new songs. I like those new songs. We need to learn new songs. Absolutely. But some people think if the service doesn't go the same way that it went before, another time, somehow just we lost the presence of God. We're conditioned to respond by repetition. It's almost like a dog teaching a dog to fetch a stick, teaching a dog a new trick over and over again. You re repeat it over and over again until they actually do it by habit. We have way too many churches that are practicing by repetition. You got to do it this way, this way, this way. Yes, I do have an agenda. I feel an agenda every week, but I pray to God that I don't worry about this agenda as much as I worry and concern about the presence of God. If he asked me to change it, I need to be willing to change it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I am so worried in our nation that we have so many churches that are dying because they're just repeating things over and over and it has no meaning. 
So God doesn't want us to be dependent on our repetition that keeps us from really hearing God. After a period of time, you go through the motions and then your churches become dead, right? Now here's the third question. The third question. How do we seek the presence of God? I just want two things really quickly. How do you seek the presence of God? If we're not to be seeking manifestations, and we're not to expect God to work in the same fashion every time, every time his, his, his presence is felt, it's not always because of the same thing. What are we supposed to do then? We have to understand that seeking the presence of God can't come from a manifestation, which we're, we're going to talk about in just a moment, and we're also going to talk about it's that it never satisfies or settles things. So let's look at the manifestations that never satisfy. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 and 3, you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you, to know what was in your heart. And so he humbles you, allowed you to hunger and and defeat you with manna, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. The word proceeds is a present tense. It's not a past tense. So that spoken word, when we are in his presence, Elijah did not get caught up in the manifestations when the wind came and the fire came and the earthquake came, right? But in this still small voice, his presence spoke to his heart, even with all the clamoring that's going on around him. So a manifestation cannot satisfy because God's doing something new every time we come to him. Every time we come to worship, whether it's privately or publicly, God's always working something new and different in our life. Amen. You say amen. amen. So if God worked through the same methods, we would depend on the manifestations. We wouldn't depend on him, would we? So our dependence would not be on the person of Jesus Christ. It would be dependent on the experience. God never asked you to seek an experience. He asked you to seek a person. Amen. Don't seek the experience. Seek the person. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Just like manna. God gave me manna. Do you know manna wasn't, wasn't there to satisfy them? That was just to get them through. That wasn't supposed to be the finale satisfaction. You see, to pursue manifestations would bring us to a place of never being satisfied. We always have to search for something that will make us feel better emotionally. Our relationship with God is not based on our emotions, although God does use our emotions. There's nothing wrong with being emotional in the Lord. Praise God. But it's easy to just settle for the mental understanding of God rather than the intimate power of God working in manifestations. Don't look and seek for the presence of God. Manifestation is all about us feeling something we want to feel. Are you getting what I'm saying today? Super important. And finally, manifestations settle for a mental relationship. Too often when a Christian seeks the manifestations, they become disillusioned and begin to practice offbeat behaviors. This is where sometimes people get upset with we Pentecostals because we do weird things. It's okay to be weird once in a while, right? If the spirit moves you and you're a little weird, okay, so what? But I know when I was growing up, uh, we always said, it seems like the church was constantly combating that. Well, I won't go to that church because they roll in the aisles or they jump over the pews and blah, blah, blah. You know, you've heard the stories. You know, let me get its bad name. Well, some of those were real. Some people really, you know, people dance around the, the church. Sir, that's, some of it's real, some of it's not. 
depends on the person and the individual, whether they're following the manifestation or whether they're really following God. That's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what turns the world off sometimes. And look, I don't care what they say about it. If it's God, I don't care what they say. If it's God, we're going to do what God says. Come on, somebody, are you with me? <laughs> and so some Pentecostals have sought those manifestations instead of their relationship. And so we seek manifestations, we settle for a mental understanding of God, and we never get satisfied. I've seen this happen over. My dad's ministry, my dad used to get, um, I don't know, my dad's not watching. He's, he's in church. <laughs> My dad used to get so upset. People would come, they would call him, they'd get filled with the Holy Spirit, God would bless them, and then he wouldn't see them for, for how long. You know, they don't come to church. They don't, I mean, they just, it's like, it's like you really had a God change, a God transformation, and, and you don't even bother, you know, following through with that. You're just looking for the manifestation. You're not looking for the power of God. And they're never satisfied. They're always talking, oh, they're running to another church. Or they're running over here. They're running somewhere else. And always searching and never having experience. <laughs> and they lose the spiritual edge. And some people wonder why they lose their spiritual edge in God. Because they're searching for the other things. They're not searching for God himself like Moses did. God has created us for much more than we're willing to seek for. A.W. Tozer wrote this book called The Pursuit of God. It's a great book. The whole transaction, here's what he says, the whole transaction of religious conversation had been made mechanical and spiritless. The man is saved, but he's not hungry nor thirsty after God. In fact, he is specifically taught to be satisfied and is encouraged to be content with little. Ooh. We are created to dwell with God in reality, not just in theory. Until we desire and hunger and thirst for a deeper relationship with God, we will never be satisfied. We will settle for mental understanding of God. We'll settle for the status quo. And the selling for status quo means that I can't be all that God created me to be. So when we settle for the mental relationship of God, our focus is on the things we have no bearing of eternal values. We look at our stuff, our things. We become self-focused. And we waste our time, our energy on the temporal things of life, and we forfeit the eternal. Amen. It was Jesus who died to remove the veil that separated us from the presence of God. Yes. He removed the veil. We have the presence. We can go in the holy of holies. Praise God. Psalms 84, 2, David says, My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. He does, he goes on to say that the sparrow and the swallow have followed homes or found homes, I should say. And yet he confesses himself homeless because he yearned for the dwelling place of God. It should be the goal of every Christian to hunger for the presence of God. The closer you are to God, the more hunger and thirst for him Listen, the closer you we are, the stronger we'll become and the more effective we will be. Amen. We've been told, and I said this before and I'm going to repeat it because it's such a powerful illustration. Some of you may have read Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, which is the literature from the 17th century, which is Jonathan Edwards, the preacher, Jonathan Edwards, who preached a message entitled that, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He preached that message, people literally weeping and crying, ripping the pew in front of them over conviction from the Holy Spirit. He preached the exact same message at his own church. The exact same message. And it had no effect whatsoever on the congregation. 
But in this church, he preaches the message in monotone voice. He reads his entire message. He reads it. Nothing wrong with reading your message. If that's the, the style you have, and that's the way you preach, I've seen preachers do that, and it's very effective. And others who don't even look at a note. But that's not the point. That's not the point. The point is one audience had a passion for what? What can God do for me? The other audience is, I have a passion for who he is. And they were moved by the Spirit of God. What's the difference in response by audience? That's the difference. And I close with this. We have to ask ourselves these questions. If we're going to have a relationship with God that goes to the next level in our church, in our own experience in our life, and have a deep satisfaction of God's power and presence, we have to ask ourselves, what is our core motivation for the presence of God? Is it the Israelites or is it Moses? How is the presence of God found in Scripture? God's presence is everywhere, no matter where you go. How do we seek the presence of God? How do we answer these questions and live them out will determine our destiny, will determine whether our church will go to the next level, whether you will go to the next level, where we will see the power of God in demonstration on this hill and in our communities because we hunger and thirst for the presence of God. Hallelujah. The presence of God. Father, help us today to desire to seek you, to know you, God. Not just to get from you, but to know who you are and what you are representing in our life. You are our source today. And I pray, Lord, that as we sing this song today, that you would just pierce our heart pierce our spirit today and give us the hunger and desire, Lord, and the passion to want to put you first and foremost in everything in our life and, Lord, to serve you for just who you are. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Would you stand, please? Praise God. Praise God. Can we worship the Lord as we sing? Can we honor him this morning? Can we just give him praise? Let's just draw close to him. And if you're guilty this morning in your heart of serving God to get what you want, just repent. Ask God to help you to serve him for the right reason, to give you the right motivation, the right motive to serve and to honor him. Will you do that before we leave this place of worship today? Oh, will you worship him? Let this be your first.
side of the wilderness because it wasn't God's will or plan but because they sought God for what they could get not who he was and I believe it I'll never forget my mom said this to me over the years that so many people come to church to be blessed when they need to go to church to bless God to bless God. It's not about me, it's about God working in me and through me. God wants to give you more things than you can imagine. Follow him. Give him first place. Give him the presence that he deserves. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Lord, let that anointing go with us in all that we do. And that may we serve you out of the abundance of our heart, desiring to just serve you for who you are, for what you've accomplished in our life, for what you're making us to become is because of you, your sacrificial love, your agape love. Lord, be praised in our life. We give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Don't forget your meal. <coughs> You see us texting while you're preaching. It's because we're texting back and forth about something. It would be a good song for the end. You can text all you want because you can do it. Thank you.